Well, first of all, can I welcome everybody to to this meeting of the West Glamorgan Archives Committee? And obviously, because of the lockdown, this is our first meeting of this municipal year. So, um, yeah, a very warm welcome. Perhaps people will be joining us as and when that they log on. Uh, but uh, Kim, did you did you want to say something first? Well, I wanted to welcome you to the meeting, Louise. Actually, yes, thank you. and uh, you know, it's a great pleasure to uh, to have a new Lord Lieutenant. And uh, uh, you know, you're very welcome. I'm sure you'll get used to the way the committee works uh, fairly fairly quickly. But uh, yeah, warm welcome from all all participants. Yes. Yeah. Well, th th thank you all very, very much indeed. And uh, Kim, when we when we spoke earlier in the week, you just suggested I say a few words about myself. So I will I will keep it very brief. Uh, but I'm conscious that I know many of you, and many of you know me. But equally, there are a few people from outside of of either of the two councils who I haven't met before. So I'm sorry we can't meet uh, physically in a room where it would have been rather nice to have to have met you all. But just very briefly, uh, I've lived in Skessy for 40 years and I've worked for Swansea University, Swansea Council <coughs> and the Wales Audit Office. I've been a magistrate for 27 years and I was High Sheriff in 2017. Uh, but I'm absolutely delighted that as Lord Lieutenant, I get to chair this very interesting and very important committee. And I do look forward to working with you all over the forthcoming years. And that sounds a long time, doesn't it? But uh, I'm, I'm sure those years will pass very quickly. And I do look forward to meeting you all in person in due course. So with regards to the meeting, I think we're all getting used to this kind of platform, which is very effective and very efficient, but managing is perhaps a little bit more challenging than what it is in a meeting. So if you would like to speak, please do raise your hands and then I and Gareth, with his help, will bring you in when you want to speak. And I know that these meetings have been run very efficiently in the past, so I intend to keep up that tradition and we will aim to finish the meeting by 12 o'clock. Thank you very much. So the first item, Gareth, is apologies for absence. Yeah, but apologies from Councillor Aubrey and Nisbet Talbot and Tracy McNulty and Craig Griffiths. Thank you. And secondly, are there any disclosures of personal or prejudicial interests, please? Any disclosures? No hands going up? No? So that's fine. So the next item is are the minutes of the previous meeting. So first of all, um, can I have your um, any comments with regards to accuracy? So first of all, page one, page two, page three, page four. Oh, sorry. Yes. We've only got pages, three pages, haven't we, at the minutes? Um, Could I just mention that in the list of attendees of the last meeting, or the list of members, there's a mistake for uh, uh, Louise Miskell, uh, her institution's down as University College Swansea, which of course it's been Swansea mm -hmm. University for a number of years. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's, yes, a, that's right. <laughs> hark back to the 1990s, I think. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. Can't remember the exact date they changed over, but but yes, it is a long time ago. But it is correct in in the first page of the minutes. So th thank you for raising that, Kim. So um, all, all appro minutes approved. Yes. Yeah, thank okay. You. Thank you. And then, are there ma any matters arising which uh, which are not covered on the agenda? First of all, page one. Anything on page two? And then anything on page three? Okay. That's good, thank you very much. And then over to item four, which is the report of the County Archivist. And Kim, uh, I hand over to you to take this item, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, Kim, sorry, before you start, I, what I'll do now, everyone is mute, everyone apart from Kim. So if you, you know, when you want to speak, just unmute yourself, please. So we can get rid of any background noise then. Yeah, thank you. So, so I'll mute everyone, Kim, so can you unmute yourself then? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you, Kim. Um... Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we all get used to this medium, no doubt, uh, after a short while. Uh, 
I think what I probably want to do is uh, if anybody raises their hand, I'll take a question immediately. So if you want to break in by asking a question, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use that protocol. Um, so I'll, I'll stop speaking if anybody wants to interject. Um, you've all seen a, a copy of the report, which I'll go through in uh, section by section. And obviously the first, first and most important aspect of uh, the uh, report, which is for two quarters, so it's for six months, it relates to the, uh, the pandemic and the fact that the archive service was closed. Um, nothing uh, surprising in this, in that the, uh, the closure of the service followed the closure of many other council services on the 17th of March and then a full lockdown on the 23rd of March. Um, the, the, the following section talks about some of the work that we've done during the lockdown period, and uh, it's fairly obvious uh, to report that um, you know we weren't like most of the population. We were not really prepared for a full lockdown, although obviously some more far-sighted people might have seen it coming. So. In, in a way, what has uh, been undertaken in the last few months has been uh, innovative in some respects. Um, it's always been uh, ad hoc and uh, we've had to uh, cope with the situation as we find it, as have all public services and all organisations and companies across the UK and further afield as well. So. Um, much of the activity of the archive service has been a matter of looking at the limitations of what we're able to do, but trying to provide the best service during the uh, during the lockdown period. Um, one of the decisions we took fairly early on was uh, uh, that we would need to continue coming into the civic centre in order to check on the uh, the archives. Uh, we couldn't just down tools and then walk away from the uh, the archives. So uh, staff, uh, that's myself and Andrew Dully, continue to come in right from the the very start of the lockdown, the 23rd of March. Uh, initially, quite brief visits, but we were checking on the temperature and the humidity, and of course the security of the archive collections. Uh, this was not surprising. I mean, uh, also. Um, Every other archive in the UK still uh, was being inspected, as indeed were museums and galleries across the UK. So uh, work uh, continued uh, to, to keep an eye on the collections, but we also used the opportunity to uh, continue with certain services, which not every archive in the UK uh, continued with them. So we continued to answer post postal inquiries because the postal service post was still coming into the civic centre. Um, and we still uh, were able to provide uh, scans and photocopies of original items that um, the pub members of the public requested. Obviously, that's a paid for service. And we also uh, were able to continue to sell publications and uh, other other items that people bought using our online shop. So the service didn't completely disintegrate. Um, as time progressed, we were also able to reintroduce another service, which was um, uh, family history consultations, which uh, Pre-COVID always took place face to face in the Family History Centre. Um, after a little bit of experimentation with Facebook and I think Zoom, we settled on Microsoft Teams. And uh, so we've been able to provide uh, uh, family history consultations um, through the uh, majority of the lockdown period. Uh, via Teams, and that's provided a source of income. And uh, the figure for that is in the papers somewhere. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got that to hand, but uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, it's, it's in the report. So that's been a welcome source of um, uh, 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 income for the service. And also, uh, um, it's uh, also 
occupied a, the Family History Centre supervisor for that time. Um, I wrote the report uh, before the um, uh, uh, risk assessment for the reopening of the service went to uh, the trade unions. It's been through health, past health and safety, but I now can confirm that the service will reopen on the 29th of September. That's a Tuesday. Uh, that's our first uh, uh, weekday that would normally be open because um, uh, we're not normally open on a Monday. So we intend to open on all the days that we would be um, uh, open, uh, which is Tuesday to Friday, but with restricted opening hours. So from 10 till 12.30 and from 1.30 till 4. Um, and it's on an appointment only basis. The, um, the, the basic parameters of the service are outlined in Appendix 1 of the document. So you've seen that. Um, we still, because this has only been a matter of days since um, we've got clearance to, to reopen, it was Tuesday when the trade unions gave uh, permission to go ahead. Uh, we haven't, I'm not sure that we've publicised uh, the fact yet. I don't, have we tweeted it, Andrew? Not yet. Um, I was going to discuss with you how and what. Uh, we're preparing wording for it to go on the website as well. I think one of the things uh, we'll have a team meeting on Tuesday uh, next week, so we'll probably go through the, uh, the finer details of that. But the um, the area is laid out to uh, currently laid out to maintain social distancing, so we can accommodate a maximum of four readers at any one time. Um, we have screens, protective screens for the staff. We're ordering. Um, uh, retractable barrier belt barriers for to to avoid um, members of the public wandering off the very distinctive uh, line of uh, uh, where they're allowed to walk or not to walk. So uh, we'll have the um, uh, sort of floor uh, markers as well and uh, all the other things that um, uh, are, we're quite used to in um, relatively restricted uh, public spaces and of course as we've learned this morning um, uh, members of the public attending the archives will be required to to wear face masks uh, as it's a, an indoor public area so that's one of the other things that we'll be adding to our rules. Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to ask any questions I've talked for a fair bit and uh, I don't know whether anybody wants to ask any questions about reopening. Um, I do have a very short film which I've been involved in working last less than two minutes. I don't know sh whether you'd like to uh, to view that if I can manage the technology okay of sharing screen and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a yes. I'll just hope this works. <laughs> Andrew, if not, you might need to uh, take over. So I'll just uh, share content and hopefully I can find the uh, the thing so
I hope that worked. Yeah, I hope you saw what I saw. <laughs> Did it not work? Oh, no. Uh. Uh, sorry about that. Andrew, do you think you could uh, do the thing? Because yeah, I just I'll watched go it. Now. I've yes. got it already. Right. Oh, thank you. Ah. We haven't got any oh, we haven't got any sound there. Did that work all right? <laughs> right. Uh, we didn't have any sound, but uh, was... that was a, a lot better than watching me looking at the screen for uh, one minute and 42 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I haven't had that problem before with the uh, 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 sharing screen, but uh, Obviously, it didn't work. Uh, uh, anyway, you, you saw the thing. You didn't hear the uh, commentary. Obviously, that will be bilingual, and uh, we will uh, be putting that along with other guidance about how to uh, use the archive service on our website and asking all users to uh, both read the rules and watch the sh the short, uh, well, several short films, actually, because they also need to register for a ticket. So. Uh, um, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, things that we'll have to do as uh, prior for for readers to to do prior to to visiting the archives. Um, because we're only um, making um, uh, uh, original documents available, it's going to be a relatively select bunch of people who come to use the archives in the uh, coming weeks and months i'm afraid because the uh we can't essentially deal with um people who drop in which is a fair number of the people who um uh, uh use the archive service just coming in to um uh um uh, to ask a question maybe dealing with a boundary dispute or um a child's school project or something like that they'll very often call by but of course the civic center will be a very different place for the next few months as well in fact it's not the civic swansea civic center isn't currently open to the public and what we will have to do in the first weeks is provide a uh, list of uh, people uh, who've booked a session in the archives and then security will let them in so we'll have to both uh, guide them down the corridor and also uh, 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 liaise with security to uh, allow them to come in. But as for those of you who are have visited the Civic Centre in the last few weeks, you'll know there's a, a number of different ranges of customers using the, um, uh, uh, I say customers, but different people using the, the Civic Centre in the um, the MOJs using it for the uh, uh, the courts. So there are people coming in to use the uh, courts and there are also um, uh, other 
users of the Civic Center that are um, uh, shortly going to be um, uh, using the building. So uh, uh, we're one of uh, one of several. At some point, the contact center will reopen as well. A decision's been made for the contact center to reopen. So there'll be uh, appointment system for um, other services within the council as well for face-to-face -face services. Obviously, depending on the the progress of the pandemic as well. Um, I still see no hands, so uh, uh, Louise, uh, I think uh, I'll shut up for a second. Thanks. It's just a quick question. I did put this in the chat, but I'm not sure anyone saw it. Um, I just wanted to check because I'm having a lot of conversations with postgraduate students uh, who are all anxious to get back to the archives. Um, is it OK to tell them about the reopening date or, or is this still under wraps for now? No, I think you can tell them about the reopening date. I mean, obviously, we'll be announcing it next week, so um, uh, you can uh, uh, do that. I think one of the things that you'll, you'll have to ask them to keep an eye on the website, uh, but the uh, for the conditions of use, really. So um, I think one of the most important things is that uh, users will need to order all the documents they want in advance and they can't change their mind uh, uh, afterwards when they when they arrive to say it's the wrong volume. I wanted the next volume along or something like that. They'll have to make another session so that they'll really need to do a little bit more research than they probably do before they come to make sure they order the correct documents. That's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I should, probably should move on from this, kind of keeping an eye on uh, time, having <laughs> lost a couple of minutes as the with the film there. Uh, just mention about NEATH. Um, there aren't any plans to open the NEATH Mechanics Institute at the moment until we can work out how we can maintain social distancing. It's a more complicated building. Uh, this is in full agreement with the NEATH Antiquarian Society. Um, and obviously NEATH Patalbot would Council would have to be involved in carrying out a risk assessment and uh, arranging the health and safety for that building. And that conversation hasn't started yet. Uh, so um, obviously with Neath Patalbot councillors, they may wish to ask questions of the officers, but that's the current position uh, with regard to the Neath Mechanics Institute. And obviously I've been working closely with um, uh, Mrs. Watkins and, and now uh, David Michael as well with regarding the Antiquarian Society's views with regard to, to reopening. Um, uh, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the, the volunteers that come from the Neath Antiquarian Society uh, are generally of fairly advanced age as well and they're, um, if they haven't been shielding they've been uh, very cautious about um, uh, going uh, into public spaces, so um, you know, they they have concerns as well. So all all that uh, discussion is yet to be had. So there may be uh, an update at the next meeting, but that's the current position with regard to NEATH. Nice. Um, so anyway, moving on, uh, section two talks about some of the work that we've done during the 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 two quarters. The um, uh, as I said to start off with, we um, um, uh, we, we weren't planning for a lockdown. Uh, we had to uh, 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 extemporize, if that's the right word. Uh, we had to um, uh, work out, like other uh, council venues, you know what services we could provide during the lockdown period. And I think one of the things that uh, we have done before, and we've got a certain amount of successful track record with, is in putting, uh, uh, creating exhibitions and uh, short films, uh, and also posting on social media. And um, I think it's reasonable to say that we have um, made a number of quite successful films. Uh, you'll see on page six of the report how many views some of those films have had. Uh, they've also coincided in uh, several cases with uh, national 
commemorations. So we had the 75th anniversary of VE Day back in, in May. Um, we created a, uh, uh, a resource uh, relating to um, Basque refugee children in Swansea in the 1930s to coincide with World Refugee Day. Um, we've created some delightful films, which I know several members, uh, Councillor Jones being one of them, have uh, praised uh, um, uh, in, in so on social media and men mentioned in other meetings that the, the, we've created uh, some uh, uh, rem reminiscences of from using old photographs from uh, right across the two local authority areas. Um, and if any members want to look at those films, you can find them all on Facebook. There's a link in, in the report there. Um, pause there in case anybody wants to say anything on that, on the activity during uh, during lockdown. Uh, Councillor Jones. Who might be on mute. It's, 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 sorry, apologies. Um, not only to congratulate you for the work you did on the films and the posts on social media, I shared a lot of them and the reaction from the public has been tremendous. So really well done. It was a great showcase for the archive. So, uh, you know, thank you. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks for the feedback. Um, I w would mention that I'm very keen for the staff to get back to the, the core activity of um, working with the archives, because one of the things we've been separated from the archive collections for um, uh, a number of months and there is the basic core activity of uh, archive work working with the collections that's cat whether it's cataloging cleaning boxing and uh, other things and and that can only be done by working on site so we are looking as well as reopening to the public looking to bringing back staff on site on a three two basis which i think is a common uh, division uh, that that would be either three days in the office, two days working from home, or three days working from home, or two days in the in in the office, uh, um, uh, in order to uh, bring staff back in. Uh, what I've done is I've divided the the full complement of staff. So we are nine people. We're not nine full time equivalent, but we are nine nine bodies, as it were. Uh, divided the staff into two teams, teams A and B, and there are four team, uh, four members in each team. So effectively, they don't meet each other physically. Uh, it'll be um, team A and team B, and they work on different different ends of the week. Um, and I'm slightly kept apart from that because I'm mostly doing managerial work. So uh, it's very rare for me to actually have. Uh, contact with the, um, uh, the the actual documents themselves uh, a little bit more contact with the public than uh, than that but um, I'm attaching myself to team B so um, that would be uh, being in the office on Thursdays and Fridays part of part of which explains why I'm in the office today actually because I'll, obviously Thursdays and Fridays are my day and uh, there's a, a fair amount of preparation to work to do as you can imagine so th that that I'll just uh, uh, append on to, I forgot to uh, mention some of the um, online resources for schools that we also um, uh, created. So we've put some of the teaching material that we've uh, created for schools over the years onto our website um, uh, so that children are able to access it um, uh, directly online rather than um, because I don't see that school visits and school groups are going to recommence anytime soon. Um, so um, uh, obviously we'll keep a watching brief on that, but I think it's very unlikely that uh, the education service will be able to resume in the near future. Um, moving on, if um, that's just looking for uh, any anybody wants to say anything, the annual report of the County Archivist was uh, published in May, as it usually is, 
um, Councillor Rees. Thank you, Kim. Um, as far as schools are concerned uh, and about the material that's out on online, has communication gone out to schools to inform them of that? Uh, I think one of the things, we, uh, it's a very valid point, and I think possibly we need to start getting uh, in touch with schools. Um, obviously, the majority of the, um, the lockdown period, I can see Andrew's going to say something in a minute, but the, um, uh, I, I'm actually, I'm sorry, could we just clarify in terms of the availability of online resources or about the availability of group visits? Because uh, you're asking about the, have we made, made schools aware of the, uh, uh, the online resources. Yes. Uh, so, oh, yes. sorry. Right. Yes. I, I, I'll let Andrew uh, respond to that actually, because uh, he knows more than me. Um, this was done in the first instance um, early on in lockdown when um, parents were homeschooling children, and the idea there was to provide resources for them to do that. Um, we advertised it on social media, but it really was for parents and and and. Um, and, uh, and and pupils uh, learning at home. We haven't told schools yet. We're still trying to, to establish um, the extent to which it'll be possible for us to provide our school service. Um, but uh, we figured really that at the moment, schools have got enough on their plates opening up again. Um, and, and if we communicated with them at this stage, it, the, the danger is that anything will get lost in the sort of general melee of emails that must be going this way and that. But we will do so shortly so that they know what is available. The two resources we put out there are the two sort of common ones which are done for um, key stage two pupils, um, which is to say the, um, the the Blitz resource and the one about rich and poor Victorians, which is very which are very popular um, and it's fairly generic material. Um, and it, it's um, we know it's been looked at several times so far. I mean, it was looked at uh, in excess of 100 times, um, use 100, 100 times and more um, during the lockdown period. OK, OK. Thank you. Um, I'm going to gloss over the following. Well, I mentioned the annual report. If if members haven't seen the annual report, I do recommend that uh, you take a look. Um, I think a, an email, general email was sent out. Um, uh, uh, at the time back in May, but it is a good read. Um, there's some really uh, interesting local history articles, including one on the uh, the uh, Spanish flu uh, pandemic of 1918, uh, which I thoroughly recommend um, uh, members to read because it's uh, an interesting comparison with present times. Um, I'd also like to gloss over the statistics. Uh, pretty obvious that the statistics for use of the service are fairly dire in terms of uh, physical visits to the archives, because uh, essentially we we closed after only a couple of weeks of the six month period, and we haven't been open since. And I also ought to warn members that the um, the, the statistics for the coming quarters, until such time as we're able to resume a full service, will also be pretty low because we can only manage four people in the um, uh, the morning and four people in the afternoon. And in many cases, it's going to be this, uh, the same four people, I would think, who may want to come for the whole day. You know, it, it's uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be taking eight, eight people per day. It may just be uh, those keen researchers who haven't been able to use the archives for a number of uh, months uh, coming in and booking a whole day, uh, having to go out at lunchtime. So we can expect low figures for the uh, for the immediate future as well. But the online figures are have held up, and and indeed the income from our resources being on ancestry and find my past have held up fairly well. And that's understandable that uh, during the lockdown period, a fair number of people have been using our digital online resources and indeed searching the the catalog and sending in inquiries and so on and we've had a, a really significant increase in the number of emails of uh, uh, requests for um, um, uh, uh, help and assistance and so on so they they are um, uh, very in very very many cases resorting to email when they haven't been able to use the archives themselves 
Um, I'll move on, just looking for hands raised. Section five uh, relates, which is on page eight, relates to, uh, in particular, to the creation of teaching resources relating to Wales's connection with the slave trade, which is something that the archives are leading on. Um, in the first paragraph of that section, I just mentioned a, uh, uh, some fairly general things about why this is so uh, uh, current uh, in uh, our consciousness. Uh, I'm sure that that is uh, uh, common knowledge. Uh, I should just mention that Swansea Council, like many other local authorities, is um, carrying out an audit of street names and statues, and that we're part of that um, process. And in due course, there will be a report into which the, the knowledge of the archives will feed. Funny enough, my conversations this morning in the office have been relating to that because the audit of street names is uh, just coming to completion. So. Um, I've just been talking to a colleague in local studies this morning about uh, uh, that, which I think I'll be able to see this afternoon. So uh, um, the, that's one of the requests of the, um, the PDC, uh, uh, the um, equalities. Uh, sorry, Louise, I've forgotten the, the correct title of the uh, committee. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful. Equalities and Future Generations Policy Development Committee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not okay. surprised I stumbled on that. <laughs> um, but one of the things we've done on our own initiative, um, but it does link in with the work of um, uh, that Professor Charlotte Williams is undertaking on behalf of Welsh Government is a review of the, uh, well, she, she she and her working group are undertaking a review of the uh, Wales curriculum to look at the significant gaps in the curriculum relating to um, uh, many aspects of uh, history. It could be Wales's connection with the slave trade, the um, the history of empire, Wales's connection with empire, um, and indeed the uh, the overall contribution of immigrants to the economy and culture and general um, uh, uh, well-being of uh, the nation. Um, and I think that's a really important piece of work that is uh, it's been prompted by this. It's something that we've been kind of edging towards um, for a number of years. Um, we have a member of staff, David Morris, archivist, who is um, particularly interested in this aspect of our history. And we've produced a number of um, uh, uh, exhibitions in the past. Um, and indeed, David, before he came to work for the Archive Service, produced a, an exhibition for the National Museum Wales, the National Waterfront Museum in Swansea, uh, called Everywhere in Chains, which was Wales's connection to the slave trade. And I think one of the things that I'm really keen for us to do is to make that into something more tangible that could be used to help the um, uh, the new curriculum when the changes to the curriculum are made. Now, it's quite difficult to actually second guess what changes to the curriculum will be made because we don't know what the outcome of the working group is going to be. But I understand a, an initial report is expected in the autumn. So things might just line up. Um, in the meantime, we've been uh, we set up a project with Glamorgan Archives in Cardiff and uh, Glamorgan Archives is also very keen to work on this aspect and we are looking at who we need to engage with so uh, we'll engage with key partners such as Race Council Cymru, um, the, the secondary uh, school uh, teachers network uh, for history certainly we've got links in Swansea but maybe some of the groups that Councillor Rees mentioned previously in these patrol but will also engage with this project as as well and likewise uh, Glamorgan Archives will want to uh, engage with um, uh, the history teacher networks in their local authority areas and they cover uh, six local authority areas so it's basically the former mid and south Glamorgan so it's uh, uh, Cardiff, the Vale and the Valleys. So um, there'll be a lot of consultation, a lot of work. Um, so we won't be 
produce i think it's more important to get it right than get it out quickly because there has been some discussion that well black history month is coming up in october but uh unfortunately we won't we won't be able to produce anything in that sort of time frame but it's far more important that it's something that's relevant that is speaks not just to um uh, uh the majority in indigenous community however uh, uh, say in 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 Glamorgan but also to you know the the black and uh, Asian and minority ethnic communities right across uh, our areas as well and it's something they need to have some input in into um the um um uh into the teaching material so the aim would be that it's something which you know we can all be proud of uh um so uh i think it's going to be slow but it's really important to be slow and laborious rather than to 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 get to get the uh something that is criticized so uh i think consultation is hugely important in this uh councillor gibbard wants to speak there no, just just wanted to, to to say thank you to you and the team for all the work you're doing on this because obviously it's such a um, an, an important piece of work and it's going to coming under quite a, you know it's in the public spotlight at the moment and um, and I think it's um it, you know it's going to be really really interesting to see how it progresses and um, yeah I can't wait to see the results and uh, yeah, obviously got vested interest it's something I'm personally really passionate in it yeah. about so it's yeah. going to be great to to see the outcome of that so thank you to the team. Thanks. Thank you. I think one of the things that we could also uh, sensibly do is actually um, turn it into different modules. So I think I think slavery is is very much in people's um, uh, uh, uppermost in people's minds at the moment because of the uh, the BLM uh, protests and the toppling of statues. So, uh, but there are there is far more that could be added to the Wales national curriculum. So. You know, one of the things that links into um, uh, the uh, the slave trade is the early black presence in Wales, which I think is really un under recognised. But we uh, have access to parish registers and uh, other early records, which show that there were black people living in Swansea, um, in Cardiff. Uh, relatively early on, uh, I've forgotten the date, but I think the earliest the earliest one is Cardiff, and I think the name is James Potiphar, and I've forgotten 1645. I think is the date that springs to mind, but I might be to getting that totally wrong. But um, certainly, David Morris has found entries for uh, black people in parish early pa parish registers of Swansea St Mary as well. I think they're sort of around about 1800. So afraid figures are a little bit off the top of my head I'd like to be a bit more precise about dates than than that but uh haven't got the uh, the thing to hand so uh, but that uh, that's something that is really you know was new to me and uh, um, technically I'm the keeper of the records but I think for the vast majority of people they would not have realized that um you know there were um uh freed slaves and uh um and probably servants. Um, uh, that's probably the the, the thing uh, that were um, uh, living in uh, Glamorgan at a very early early stage. And and then there are different histories of um, uh, 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 different uh, different members of the black community. And in the 19th century, there are a couple of sisters in Swansea, for example, that uh, uh, have a really interesting history. And, uh, you know, we could tell some personal stories. I, I think that's we can sort of build on on uh, start start with the the issue of the slave trade, but then sort of build that into a uh, a, a picture to show that there was far more uh, diversity in our area than people think, because uh, people will associate you know, the, the black presence uh, black presence in our area with Windrush. You know, there's so much concentration on Windrush, but actually it goes back centuries earlier than the Windrush generation. And um, uh, that's that's a story that hasn't been told for a, uh, uh, and it needs to, needs to be told, told more and it needs to be t told in schools as well. Um, 
I'll move on if that's... Oh, Gar- Gareth, you've got your hand up. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can we get... Yeah, there's a report going to Cabinet in Swansea next week from the Education PDC, of Councillor Lyndon Jones is a member, looking at um, their recommendations for the new curriculum in Swansea and what schools should oh, and right. shouldn't do. So it yes. may be worth you having a look at that and trying to link up uh, this initiative with that. That's all I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's really useful. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, I, I was just about to mention that when, when the report goes to cabinet, it, it's it's about the what school leader do to respond to the to the new curriculum and what one needs to do to support. So that's a wonderful opportunity to link up the archive service and, and, and schools as part of that work. You know, um, yes. Relating the history curriculum in schools and, and indeed other things like citizenship and so on, we, we, it's all part of, and we can uh, make use of of resources you've got in that in, in the forward direction great uh perhaps gareth if uh could get, send me a link when if it's going to be published online and then uh, we could involve uh in involve that in the uh our you know consultations and uh taking stock of uh different uh, uh different uh reports and so on yeah yeah it was published earlier this week. I'll send you a copy after the meeting. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gareth. One of the things specifically we're looking at is, is professional learning communities and supporting those. And I mean, that links with with the work of, of working with history teachers and, and, um, and others in schools uh, to help drive this forward. And it's got a, a great deal of potential. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll move on, if that's OK, on to section six, which I think is probably one of the, the meatier sections in the, the report, um, in that it is a source of uh, concern. Um, the A year ago, um, the uh, we came up for a halfway review for archives accreditation. So archives accreditation lasts for six years, subject to review at the halfway point um, and that point we reached last um, uh, last November um, and of course we were able to have a meeting face to face last December um, the archive service was uh, uh, given moved from uh, accredited status to provisional accredited status status based on the uh, several aspects of the service that the panel considered uh, needed uh, addressing. Um, One of these was that we had no plans for the future relocation of the archives. Should Swansea Council uh, make a decision to vacate the Swansea Civic Centre? Which very much looks like the direction of travel, although it hasn't a formal decision that I understand hasn't been made yet on the looking in Gareth's direction. <laughs> it's, uh, do, uh, I, I thought it was going to be in September, but it's is it January now? Or? I think the report has been delayed with COVID and I think it's due to go in October or November now. It's it's right. slipped and keeps slipping, unfortunately. Right. Um, there is no there is no long term plan for the archives. Um, uh, we've said this. Well, actually, we, I, I was thinking about this. But I think we've been saying this for about five years, actually, because um, I think it was round about late 2015 that the uh, first um, discussions about uh, the phase two of the city centre regeneration um, project were uh, first mooted. Um, all that I've been able to uh, um, uh, to plan for is the temporary relocation of the archives uh, to other archive repositories. Um, and during the lockdown period, I've been able to continue discussions uh, with um, Glamorgan Archives and with uh, the Richard Burton Archives of Swansea University, obviously rem- remote meetings via, via Teams with um, uh, Sean Williams in the Richard Burton archives and um, the new Glamorgan archivist in Cardiff, uh, Laura Cotton. Um, 
and prior to that with the outgoing uh, county archivist Susan Edwards. Um, we have agreement in principle for the archive collections to be located in temporarily in those two archive repositories. I should say that no, neither of those two archive repositories is large enough to accommodate the whole of the archive service collection. So they're going to have to be split into two. And we still haven't done the calculations yet as to whether that is sufficient um, for the, uh, the whether the two archive repositories combined ha have got enough vacant space in order to accommodate the the two collections. And one of the decisions that will have to be made is how you split the collections. You know, uh, um, there are some things that will definitely have to go to Cardiff, like the parish records and the public records, because Swansea University is not recognised for uh, keeping either of those types of records. So it wouldn't be the case that you could say that all material relating to Swansea goes to Swansea University and all material relating to Neath Patolbert goes to um, uh, Cardiff. Uh, and that would be really difficult anyway, because there are county wide, West Morgan county wide collections. So it would have to be based on the classification, the types of records that are uh, doing, but we still so we'll still don't know. We have to. This is one of the really important uh, pieces of work that we'll have to do as soon as we uh, are able to uh, spend more time in the office, because this work was abruptly ended during the, the lockdown period to work out what the precise volumes of different categories of collections are and then to uh, uh, to discover from the other repositories. So it's not just been ourselves that have not been able to do the work, but the uh, Glamorgan archives can't say for definite how much space they've got available. And of course, it would be from the beginning of 2024 anyway. Uh, so, you know, they've got to try to pre um, pre calculate how much available space they would have in three years time um, and similarly with the Richard Burton archives as well and it's, it's also very complicated because we can't make a definite uh, s statement that we want to take that space although I think it's only fair to the other repositories to say uh, you know once we know that we once a definite decision has been made to leave Swansea Civic Centre and we have a definite date I think we need to make a definite commitment because otherwise we're kind of messing around to other institutions with whom we have friendly relations. So if we, I think, I think we must all realise at this point that there is not going to be a new archive building in Swansea if the decreed date for the vacating the civic centre is going to be the end of 2023, as is currently the discussion. Uh, thing. Um, so we do need to make a temporary plan and that that is also really important. Sorry, Councillor Jones, I'll come back and I'll finish my uh, point, but thank you. Uh, I can see the hand raised, but the it's also very uh, important for trying to maintain the accredi accreditation status, because if I can't produce a plan um, uh, of any description for the accreditation panel, uh, we will lose our accreditation. Um, not only that will be a certain reputational loss associated with the loss of accreditation, but it also cuts the archive service off from sources of external funding. It's a little bit like a catch-22 situation that uh, if we're not an accredited, accredited service, um, then, then we may not, for example, be able to make an application to the Heritage Lottery Fund um, and that cuts us off from sources of external funding for the building which we need in order to get out of the situation that we find ourselves in. So it's most important that we retain our accredited status, not just in terms of reputation. You know, I don't want to be the first archive service in Wales that loses accreditation, um, but um, it's uh, possibly the first in the UK, actually. I don't know that the accreditation has been withdrawn for any other service. Uh, 
that it also cuts us off from external funding sources, which we may be necessary to the for the um, uh, any applications for for new buildings. Uh, Councillor Jones, you've had your hand raised for a little while. Okay, thank you, uh, Kim. Yeah, I, I think uh, obviously to lose accreditation is it would be a disaster and unacceptable. In the same way, to move the service to Cardiff would be equally unacceptable uh, because uh, local people wouldn't be able to access it, uh, and it would, you know, it would be almost the end of the service here. I did uh, put a question into council, and uh, a report is to be presented to cabinet and how long uh, for all services in the autumn. Uh, you know, really, and we just need to be keeping uh, pushing, you know, the, the cabinet for a decision, really, because, as I say, it would be a real disaster for the service to move to, to Cardiff. Thank you. I don't know whether any other member wants to talk about this. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, uh, Kim. Um, first of all, the, the report is due to go to cabinet in October, as I understand it. Um, I think it might be worth um, Lyndon or someone else calling into the scrutiny committee in advance that meeting so we can address this and other issues around the, the accommodation. Um, but I, I, I agree with Lyndon. I think it would be a disaster if we have to move the archives to Cardiff. I think we do need to find a better solution to that. And I think really, given that we we highlighted this several years ago, I would have hoped that we would have been more longer term thinking on behalf of the uh, council uh, management team in terms of how to address this particular issue. Uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, uh, just, just, I think it's, it's just to update really. Uh, the the answer to Lyndon's question said yesterday uh, in yesterday's council meeting. I think it's referred to a report going to cabinet in the autumn, um, and that they were looking for either a complete or a phased uh, solution to the to the issue. Um, and you know until that's uh, until we have sight of, the, of that report, uh, I think it's, it's a matter of of, of keeping up uh, watching deep on it. Could, could I just respond to this? Uh, uh, the two points raised, saying it would be a disaster for things to go to Cardiff. Um, I, I, d I don't agree. With, I agree with that. I do think that it would be a disaster if the archives were to be stored in less than archival conditions. That would be, you know, uh, for me the the uh, potential disaster that. The most important thing is that the archives remain secure and in archival storage. So I think that, you know, to say, uh, I'm sort of slightly exaggerating, but to say that they could be put into a storage area which is in Swansea um, because they need to stay in Swansea would, would not be the solution. They have to be kept in archival storage. I'll just point out that Carmarnish's records are all in Cardiff at the moment while they're building have shortly to reopen their new archives, which I understand is November, it's going to be reopened. But they've been in Cardiff for a number of years and it's not been politically unacceptable to Carmarnishire Council that that's the case. And in fact, the, the all the contents of the Glyn Vivian Art Gallery were also in Cardiff in Glamorgan archives for a number of years while the, the art gallery was being refurbished. So provided it's a temporary solution, I think it's more important that we we maintain the um, uh, integrity and the uh, security and the environmental storage conditions of the collections rather than say where they are because Cardiff would be able to provide the uh, the public service that people expect for the archives but you wouldn't be able to get that if we put them into you know some sort of storage area elsewhere sorry the number of people sorry I think <laughs> Councillor Rees probably hasn't had the opportunity to say anything sorry Am I mic to work? Oh, there we are. Um, thank you, Kim. I, I just want to remind uh, fellow councillors there that it isn't a Swansea archives. It is a West Glamorgan archives and Heathcote Talbot is a part of it. So, you know, I would like to uh, emphasise that perhaps the views of Neathcote Talbot councillors could also be taken on board. Yeah. 
sorry, uh, Councillor Black. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. I, I absolutely, uh, Peter, Peter is absolutely right about that. And obviously, Neath Bit Harbour will be asked to pay their fair share, no doubt, of any new facility when it's being built. Um, and I totally agree with Robert as well that we have to wait to see the report. My concern is that if the archive, I mean, and yes, you're right, there should be a proper storage area. But my concern is if the archives are moved to Cardiff, when we don't have a clear plan as to, to permanently house them, that they might get forgotten there. And I think that's, that's the concern I have about moving into Cardiff at this stage. I think that's a very valid point and uh, uh, it's one of the uh, things that does concern me. The one thing that I will say with that, uh, that uh, Glamorgan Archives have made it very clear it's only a temporary solution and that any permanent solution would require uh, Swansea and Neath Patolbert Councils both to provide a capital sum to uh, well, Cardiff Council, in effect, in order to uh, build an extension to the building. Uh, and I think that we're talking about political unacceptability. I think that uh, providing a capital sum to a uh, council to which to some extent is some, somewhat of a, uh, a friendly rival to uh, the, the council will be uh, really stick in the mouths of many, many local councillors that uh, uh, money was, uh, you know, that would probably be in the re realm of, you know, a million or a couple of million uh, to to build a, uh, uh, an extension to a building in the suburbs of Cardiff would probably not go down very well, I would think. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, just to reassure Peter, uh, you know, when, when I said we need to keep a, uh, a close eye on this, I was referring to, to the Archives Committee collectively, so obviously I would uh, include Neil but as a, as a key partner. Yeah, I, I do think we need to uh, have some sort of response to the uh, accreditation panel. Um, uh, and I do think it's only within my remit to be able to say that we've uh, entered discussions and uh, have worked out a plan for how the archives could be temporarily relocated. Uh, what I don't want to do is come back to you in December and say, I'm sorry, we've lo just lost our accreditation status because I would think you would um, uh, uh, be holding me to account. Uh, you know, did you not make more effort to to try to do, do that uh, uh, to to avoid that? Sorry. Um, so uh, I do think that the only thing that is in my remit is is in order uh, to find a safe and secure solution, temporary solution for the archive collections, um, and it se this seems to be the most practical uh, uh, solution given that those are the two neighbouring services that have spare space and can offer the, the the quality of service and the quality of storage that the archives require. I mean, it, my primary concern, as you would expect to be, is for the long term preservation of the archives. Um, and that absolutely has to override uh, all matters relating, you know, even at the bottom end uh the, the the very end would be public access you know because if uh public access were provided in but the archives were not uh looked after in the way that they should be then we risk the long-term preservation of those collections or indeed you know if it's not a secure area that they could be uh you know they could be uh, broken into or whatever so you know security and environmental conditions are paramount for thing and that's nothing more or less than what the accreditation panel would be saying as well you know so it's not the accreditation accreditation panel consists of uh, peer professionals archivists welsh government and those are the kinds of concerns that the um the service will uh, uh be expected to be um uh, dealing with in our response um, I'll report back on the, uh, the the next meeting as to how we go. It may be possible to get some sort of time extension because of the COVID pandemic, you know, so we may say we need a further three months to provide a formal response because of the situation. That, that may be a valid uh, thing. Uh, I will wait to see chair wishes to. Yes, um, Kim, do, do you need the committee to um 
to, to give their approval for your your clearly articulated uh, plan for the the temporary accommodation of the of the um, the archives. Do you I think it would be useful if you indicate broad uh, consent to to go forward. Uh, I, I think we're between, caught between a rock and a hard place in a way, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure that there is any other practical solution which meets the requirements of the accreditation panel, given that we don't have a long term solution that we can wave in front of them and say, you know, we we have a plan to use this building or that building or uh, build a new building or, or whatever. Yeah, because it's clear from what you say, Kim, that if if you if you can't satisfy the the requirements of the um, of the committee of the panel then we will lose our accreditation is that fair to say yes yeah. indeed okay yeah. um i think i think i don't know how we uh, indicate whether there's broad consent but i suppose by <laughs> general perhaps just by putting up your hands perhaps that that would give us an indication i suppose you could put yes put uh, yes yeah but if, if i could just say you know that, that that should be a fallback position and that is not yeah. or, you know pending everything else failing then mm. that we don't want that's not the favored option of the committee i think that's what we need to yeah yeah yeah. yeah, I I totally understand, but I I think we've got to be realistic because we're possibly three years away from vacating the civic centre, and the that is not time to find a building, convert a building, build a new building, uh, apply for external funding. That the the time scale is just too too. I mean, the, I think Carmarthenshire Archives took. Uh, six years from start to finish i've not come across any other building proposal that's taken less than that amount of time so we might be talking you know, about three years for the collections to be in temporary storage at that kind of time frame mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate but it's we haven't really got anywhere in the five years that we've sort of been batting this about really we we had talks with the university and with Carmarthenshire about a joint facility and they came to nothing and we're still back at square one with regard to the, uh, the long term plans for the archives. OK, so we have we have broad support from the committee for for Kim's suggestion for the plans in the short term, which will satisfy the needs of the accreditation panel and and also allow him to continue with discussions and negotiations uh, with uh, with, with Cardiff and, and the university so that they have a clear understanding as well of, of where they are too, which is only fair on them too, given the demands on, on their respective services as well and their needs to take, uh, their need to, to plan, to forward plan as well. Okay, yeah, thank you great. very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and just as a very brief, uh, I'm aware I've gone, over, we've gone over the hour, <laughs> but uh, hopefully that's okay. But it is a serious point and I, I think members ought to be aware of this. This has been sort of looming on the horizon uh, for uh, some time. And obviously with uh, the pandemic, it's been pushed to the, into the background, but the timescales both for the accreditation panel review and the, uh, the vacation of the Civic Centre have, have not changed. And uh, uh, so uh, it's sort of crept up on us. Uh, I could just very quickly ask if members would uh, uh, approve the policies which are at Appendix 2. Uh, these are also a, an important part of our uh, submission to the accreditation panel in November. Our revised policies which have been updated and uh, now uh, it's um, this this is not the sum sum total of our policies because there were some po policies that were put to the last meeting back in March, but uh, they we've amalgamated certain policies so that they interrelate, talk to each other, which was one of the um, the comments of the panel that um, our policies didn't they seem to have been written in isolation and they didn't refer backwards and forwards to each other in the way that they should do. Okay, thank you. If, if everybody could sh um, show their hand just to formally approve those policies, please. Everyone. Thank you. All approved. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Well, I'll just um, 
uh, move on to the final uh, thing is about the accession of the archives collection accessions to the archive collections during the last six months obviously that is work that has mostly halted uh, but I will just mention that we did manage to secure a collection for the archives, which relates to the Upper Swansea Valley. Um, it's uh, they are Uniskedwin estate documents, which had quite sadly been um, sold, we believe, by a Brecon solicitor to a private uh, individual who. Um, uh, uh, sells, sells antiques and other uh, 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 things at the uh, antiques fairs that are quite common across South south and West Wales. Um, one of our members of staff actually found some of the documents at one of these uh, antiques fairs in, in West Wales, uh, recognised uh, their importance and we've managed to negotiate the sale of the whole of the collection or we assume it's of the collection except for whichever items might have been sold off individually um, and it's a really important collection uh, that um, relating to the upper the upper Swansea Valley which of course is in uh, Nice but Talbot um, a still um, a Vera and uh, uh, um, the upper, upper Swansea Valley crossing over to Ustragun Lice and the uh, into Breconshire as well um, so we're really pleased to have um, uh, secured this collection and um, uh, really grateful to a my member of staff who identified that the um, the collection was uh, being sold off or, or some of the items of the collection and also um, our contact in Pembrokeshire who was able to uh, purchase the collection. Uh, we bought this collection during the period of the lockdown when we were only allowed to drive five miles. It's now thankfully a distant memory that <laughs> Pembrokeshire was uh, out of the, uh, uh, the five mile radius. So um, the, uh, the, uh, the dealer rang me, uh, obviously he was on pretty hard times with regard to uh, uh, not being able to make a living during the uh, lockdown period because all no antique fairs have taken place. So uh, we were able to negotiate a, a, a good price using our third party uh, contacts and also secure the collection which he, he took and, and, and stored uh, uh, at his own house till, till we were able to collect it. I don't know whether Andrew you want to say anything more about that at all. Um, yes, please. Um, it's a it's it's a really important collection. Um, some of the earliest documents date from the time of Henry VIII, so we're talking here about the 1520s. Um, they don't even relate. They don't even refer to a property being in in Glamorgan because the the Act of Union hasn't taken place. It's it, it's it's in the in the March of Lordship of Gower at that stage. Um, they're very important because of the richness of the names. You've got. Um, Everybody from the esquires and uh, and gentlemen down to the widow Jane Thomas, who lives in a little cottage on the hill. Um, it's wonderful stuff, and it's really really important. It's quite rare to get anything this detailed this early, um, certainly for this part of Wales. So we're very glad to have been able to um, to, to 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 acquire it. Um, listing is underway, and um, and the the the, the catalogue will be produced in due course. And um, I think, uh, well, there's a, a brief article about a previous part of the collection, which we had last year in last year's annual report. Um, I'm, I haven't told you, Kim, but I'm preparing some, uh, a, some, a sort of follow up um, based on, on these, these records. There's some very interesting personal stories that come out through them. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, members will be pleased here, and particularly Neith Patalba. Members, I don't know whether we have any Swansea Valley members on the committee. It's more Neeson Port Talbot way, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, obviously it's a, a important part of the uh, uh, our area, and so we've added to the history of the Upper Swansea Valley, which is uh, really good news. I'll conclude my report there. I'm sorry I've run over time <laughs> after saying that we were going, going for an hour. <laughs> However, well, it was an important discussion. So, uh, uh, yes, I hope. 
uh, members yeah. have uh, gained something from it. Yes, no, it, it was indeed. Thank you, Kim, for your very comprehensive report. Yes, we have gone over. It's only a quarter of an hour, but under the circumstances, considering we, we didn't have a last meeting and you had a lot of very important items to, to cover in, in your report, including, of, of course, all, all about the lockdown and the reopening, which is good to hear that it is going to take place very soon. Um, but uh, it's uh, so good to see that the archive service has still been operating as best that it could during the lockdown. Uh, your family history consultations, the, uh, the films that you've produced, uh, excellent. And uh, I think it's demonstrated how the archive staff have, have really thought about the issues, thought imaginatively, creatively and laterally as to how you could still provide a service during these very difficult times. But you've uh, been able to satisfy at least some of the needs of the people uh, and uh, who use your, your archives. But I also think the, the figures, uh, the viewing figures really do reflect how important local history is to people and how how interested they are in the past. And I think it is only about um, understanding the past that we can, or knowing about the past, that we can understand the present and indeed the, the future. I enjoyed reading the annual report, excellent report, I thought, uh, really good. And I've tried to circulate it to as many people as possible. So I hope, uh, I hope uh, my contacts have, have enjoyed it as much as I have. So well done to the service for doing that. Uh, I say it was excellent. Um, really do look forward to the exhibitions and the materials that will come out of the review of the national curriculum. Absolutely fascinating to hear even just that short account of immigration into South Wales, into our area, and how far it actually goes back. I think perhaps people think that is only a very recent thing. You mentioned Windrush, and that's one of the first things that people think of. Mm. But indeed, going back to the 1600s, I'm sure not a lot of people would be aware of that. So quite clearly, a rich, uh, a rich past to draw upon for people to educate people about the value and of, of diversity and what people from other parts of the world have brought to our own culture here in, in, in South Wales. Um, the accreditation discussion, uh, ve very, uh, very good. It's something that has to be talked about. You presented uh, the, the issues extremely well there and we hope that a resolution around the archives, a home for the archives and a suitable home for the archives will be found in due course. Uh, can I say thank you to everybody for your valuable comments and observations on the items, uh, really, really helpful. I think we've had a really good discussion. I've really enjoyed my first meeting. And I want to conclude by thanking you, Kim, and your staff for the work that you have been doing over the last six months. Uh, please do convey the thanks of the committee to everybody concerned. I know you've worked extremely well and, and hard. Some of your staff have been deployed onto other duties, so you haven't been working to, to full strength. Um, but we recognise your enthusiasm in gearing up to uh, to reopen and to continue to provide the very valuable service that you have done to people, albeit it will be in a very limited way. However, we have to live with us, look forward and uh, uh, yes, it would be good to see people back into archives and, and using it as, as you want to and as, as, as we would all like to see. So thank you all very much indeed. And uh, we look forward to the next meeting. Uh, Kim, do we have a date? Oh, yes, the 11th of December. It's December, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thank so you look, very much, Louise. Yeah. So, thank so you we look kind of words. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, yeah. Kim. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you all very much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.